Hi, my name is uh, Jacob Moody. I'm involved here in ISG. I'm also, I, I work at Ice Age, and I also happen to be the vice president of the GNU Linux Club here on campus. So I'm here to kind of give a um, comprehensive instruction or kind of introduction into what Linux is, how you can use it, how it helps you, how to get around in it, what is it made out of, and what, you know, there's, you know, what else is part of a Linux that isn't just Linux? Um, so Linux itself is an operating system. Well, as most people refer to Linux, it is, it is, it is an operating system. Um, under the hood, operating systems look pretty much the exact same. There's a couple of key components that they do, and it's really just how they go apart, go about implementing these key components that really separates them from each other. Um, Linux happened to be the kernel, which is the actual Linux, is what um, is written itself by Linus Torvalds. Linus, Linux, you, you see the correlation here. Um, the kernel itself is responsible for between communication between user space and the physical machine. And so what do I mean by user space? User space is what you are in on the computer at all times. You are in a you are in the you are in the user designated part of how these things all put together if that makes sense. The the computer is creating this user environment specifically for you as the user to interact with. So the user space is not the kernel. That is, that, is the, uh, that is the set of applications that sit on top of it. So what does the kernel actually do then? Um, the kernel is in charge of the discussion between your user space and the physical machine. So when, you, when I plugged in this VGA, when I plug in an Ethernet cord, it's the kernel that's, taking, that's doing the heavy lifting of making sure that my operating system can talk to those specific drivers. And it's doing the physical, like the, you know, it's telling the CPU or however it is the motherboard to send those bytes back and forth. It's the, kind of that lower level access to these, uh, to these hardware machines. Um, that's why you know Linux itself works the same regardless on whether I'm on my ThinkPad, someone has their Dell laptop. It's the commands work the same because the kernel does a lot of the the uh, the gross work of dealing with the specifics and the driver specifics for it. So, for example, uh, the kernel deals with all file input and output. When you write a file, when you read a file, those are kernel uh, syscalls, and I'll get into more of that in a second. Um, networking peripherals like I was mentioning and user permissions your kernel is the one that says yep you are logged in as this person or nope you have input the wrong password that is the kernel that does that um, it also deals with some more technical aspects such as uh, allocating memory for programs and handling and the creation and destruction of stack for programs as they need to be executed if you don't know what that really means that's not really the scope of this le uh, lecture that would be something you could uh, get, get into more specifics if you were to look into some things like C programming and the what um, so most of these features aren't specific to, to Linux. Uh, the Windows NT kernel, likewise to Linux, has read, write, syscalls. Um, it deals with networking. It's the same idea. It's just that Windows kind of packages the user space and the kernel space together into this one package where Linux itself keeps them as a separate, um, as a separate feature. So go to here. So if, Linux is, so if Linux is the kernel, then what is this user space? Um, the classic user space for Linux is referred to as uh, the GNU core utils. Uh, the GNU core utils are what provide you with things like uh, you, uh, with things like LS and CD, uh, and like you know the print working direct or print working directory. Uh, all of these commands, I have a little list down there. Those are kind of the more complex commands that people are more uh, familiar with GNU and what they're working. Um, <clears throat> So these are utilities to help you interact with the rest of the system. So less is a way of viewing a file with a limited window space. I can do, I'll show a, a demonstration here in a second, but like things like sed, sed is another utility for quickly processing streams of text. Um, awk is a uh, text uh, natural language processing tool. Um, Emacs is the GNU standard editor. And you also have uh, GNU Screen, which creates a virtual emulator that you can uh, mess around in. These 
all of these have, um, there's lots of information about them if you look online, also in the manuals, as I will talk about in just a second. But these are kind of, you know, popular GNU core utils. So these would, these would be what your user or you as a, as a user would be interacting with. And this is how you interact with the kernel is through these user space programs. Yes? So you said that's command line, so that's Windows system? No, command by command line. I don't mean I don't mean the Windows command line. I mean a generic command line. Okay. Yep. Um, the Windows command line is governed by similar rules. Um, they have, but it's just slightly different. I won't go into that in this talk. Uh, maybe for another time. But to keep things in the sake of clarity, we'll only be talking about Linux and Unix today. Okay. So let's see. Let's look at the next one. Is this the next one? No, that's the, that's the last one. We want this one. So how do they work together? Because that is an important part. You have the user space, you have the kernel space, but you know how, what, how do they do all the magic? So there are, the user space formats things into these things called syscalls. Uh, these syscalls are the way the kernel accepts requests for special functions or information. The, the syscalls physically are made by putting specific data into a special registry and then making a special assembly call so that you basically yield to the kernel. You say, my program is waiting on your input, and then the kernel will go through and process it and hopefully very nicely um, process your request. The kernel can choose not to process your request. It could choose to not respond to your request. Um, that's, that's up for the user program to implement. As an example, if I read, if I want to read a file that doesn't, I don't own, the kernel isn't going to allow me to read it. But, you know, that's fine. The kernel doesn't want to let me to, to read it, so that my, whatever program I'm designing, I need to be able to make sure I'm catching these errors as they would happen. So, you know, if I try to open this file, I can't open the file, well, you know, I'll need to raise an error or some sort, throw some sort of exception. Uh, to make life much easier for general programmers, most of these syscalls are wrapped around C code. Uh, to put that, that last context, the syscalls, putting them into registers, that's all assembly, um, is, the, is the way that the kernel itself defines interaction with it. Luckily, for the sanity of everyone involved, uh, the uh, GNU library, the C, lib, the C library, includes these handy-dandy C functions which wrap around these assembly calls and make it a little bit more sane to interact with. Um, <coughs> Yeah, and those, those will be included. They're part of glibc, the GNU C library. You'll find them in pretty much any Nix-based operating system has this syscall-based <coughs> design to it. Um, and some examples of those is Fork. Um, if you're not familiar with the Unix process management, don't worry about that. But like things like read and write, like how I read stuff from, from, uh, from a file, how I write stuff to a file, those, these are all... Um, these are all part of this. And these are kind of exemplified when you realize that in Linux, everything itself is presented as a file to you. So um, my Ethernet card is a device. My, um, uh, my, uh, what, my graphics card is a device. My screen is uh, you know, not a device in this case. <laughs> uh, it, it, it can be. It is a device on other platforms, but that's besides the fact. Um, these, uh, these are exposed as devices because they allow um, the easiest way of interacting with these and doing, say, like the I.O. of these is to just treat them as files. So if I want to send data on my Ethernet, I just open the file and do some, uh, some transactions, read, do some reads and writes to the file, and that's how the kernel communicates or how user space programs communicate with these devices. Um, in reality, there is quite a bit of uh, skeleton and gross code because these files have highly arbitrary formats and are left often left to deal with by these um, these monolithic driver programs, which is neither here nor there. But the you know the the, the fundamental fact is that they are you know you are using these read and write syscalls to pretty much do any interaction with uh, any device on your system. This one? Yep, it is. So that's great and all to learn what they are and how they work, but how do you actually use Linux? Why do people like to use Linux? Um, so Linux, the kernel itself, and I'll, I'm going to go off a bit of a tangent here about that. So the, the graphical interface 
the Linux kernel itself does not provide a graphical interface for the user. The kernel is just that part of response that just has the responsibility of handling all of your peripherals and your devices and presenting that user space. But the user space is not all you know, fancy displays and stuff. The user space is just, you know, you have the right as an unprivileged user to execute code. Um, so uh, programmers have to then take it upon themselves to go and, uh, and create graphical environments. Oh, in which, uh, for, here's a fun little tidbit. Um, the, uh, the, uh, oops, Did I, where'd that go? Where, where, where did that get under this? Where did my window go? Oh, I guess. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Cool. So this is a this is an example of a teletype. So when I say when I talk about these terminals, these are the teletypes that these were uh, created for. Um, kind of the first interfaces for these old Unix machines. And they're called, you say, well, teletype sound, kind of sounds like typewriter. And you're right, it does. They're, they're, they're basically mechanical typewriters. Let's see if I can turn, I'll turn this. Have sound to it. Oh. Is there a... So this is uh, this right here is uh, your input to the to the terminal. Uh, these are interpreted as character sequences here. Um, that's how that reads that. And you'll see here in just a second. They'll switch over to the actual printing aspect of the teletype. I guess it's more about how these read, how they have little po they poke little holes in. In the uh, in the in them to kind of read how they're they're going along. And that's how you load one in, and that's kind of how it looks like. As you can see here, we've started typing on the actual console terminal itself, and these are printing one key at a time, physically taking a uh, a a a, a um, inked print head and stamping it to the paper. So it's printing what those dots are? Uh, yes. So the dots themselves are, are like kind of like macroed input. Okay. And these they're being processed one at a time by this uh, by this computer. So it's not it's not directly correlating to input output, but those uh, I'm trying to see they do ah there they go. They pull they, they pull it open a bit. You can kind of see ah oh, jeez. <laughs> You see it actually printing and striking the paper there. Um, so yeah, the, 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 that um, to give an example, those that uh, punched input would be what you'd be typing on your terminal. And since typing is a pain, and oftentimes you can't delete, uh, you know, people would uh, save these as these strips, that, I mean, these macros, and they would just feed it back in to, do, to run a program. So every time you, uh, a uh, funny fact, these have maintained backwards compatibility since this era. You can take one of these things and hook it up to my laptop right now and it would work. Because my, because Linux and Unix have maintained this compatibility for these old machines for pretty much forever. Um, it's just kind of a standard that they've, that they've, uh, that they've, um, set on. Uh, in fact, even from a software perspective, these are uh, these act just like modems to computers. They're just serial ins and outs. And you can, as you can hear, these things are quite loud, like really loud. Um, so are they hard to maintain with all the moving parts? Yes, they break a lot. These are, yeah, these are definitely, um, they sucked. But, you know, for the first computer terminal, they were kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a computer that's printing out a typewriter. It's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, oh, that, it's finished booting up now. Um, <laughs> it said Bell Systems at the end of it. And that's how it is when you actually type on it.
So to kind of give uh, to kind of give people a, a taste of uh, kind of how that how that how that looks. Um, it's fun. Uh, looking at old stuff like that's a lot of fun, I think. Oh, geez, I keep moving it between places. It sucks. All right. So when you connect, when you, your terminal boots up and your computer boots up and you get that serial console, uh, your computer thinks it's outputting to that thing from eons and eons ago. Um, just because it's the same code doesn't hurt anyone to keep it, and we've just built these virtual emulators of these devices around it. That's why terminal emulators are often called that, terminal emulators. They emulate the, the teletype of the terminal. Um, so back to the back to the graphical environments. Uh, the, I talked about the GNU Core Utils. The, the GNU Core Utils do not ship with a graphical environment either. They simply provide tools for utilizing the command line interface. So what do you do if you want a graphical environment, or you want to like open Firefox or Chrome or browse the web? You uh, you will need an additional program of either X11 or Wayland. And that's a comprehensive list, actually. Those are, pro pr the, those are the only two graphical programs or graphical backends to creating a graphical program in uh, Linux or Unix. Um, so these provide graphical libraries for other programs to wrap around and create what, what we call a window manager. Um, this one now I'm using is called FVWM that uh, kind of creates this, uh, this large space, all these windows, this little box down here. This is all FVWM. Um, more commonly, you might run into other environments referred to like you know KDE, GNOME, i3, DWM. There's one called Awesome, which I just put in here because I wanted to say that. Um, and you can pick whichever one you want, and that's pretty. It's a lot pretty cool. You don't often get a chance of choosing your entire graphical environment that you build yourself around. Unfortunately, you can pick whichever one you want. So that means that all the graphical instructions that you're going to find are going to be specific to how someone has set up their graphical environment, which will vary greatly. So a lot of times what this means, and not directly as a consequence, but does definitely help, is that people have oftentimes resorted to editing or telling people to configure things in the most common like interface between all Unixes and Linuxes, which is the command line. So that's why a lot of times you'll see you know, people just say, you know, just do it in the command line, because there's no, it's very similar across all systems. Um, so yeah, I guess I haven't stopped for questions before. I guess this is about, you know, it's a little bit of ways through. If anyone has any questions so far about anything that I've talked about. All right. So let's go ahead and look. Uh, we looked at this one. What? So yeah, what is this terminal thing? Um, I know we, we saw a physical terminal with the teletype. Um, but we uh, don't have much of an experience, or I haven't talked much about what a terminal looks like from user space. So let me, I want to, that's fine, I'm just going to, I think that's a dead, where is this, God, that's huge. Oh, of course it opened it way over here. So this is a terminal emulator, this is the one that I happen to use. Um, doesn't really matter which, um, but you can imagine, you know, most times a Linux environment will offer you the chance of a terminal emulator. It'll pop open a little box like this or something similar, and you'll have yourself a little terminal emulator. And so um, let's talk a bit about how you use this thing. And for the rest of this, I'll be uh, using the win command, which opens up a little uh, terminal right here. Um, so. Well, the terminal itself refers to the emulated teletype. Um, what most people think about when they talk about sh uh, terminals are uh, shell programs. Um, shell programs are exactly what they sound like. They are shells around the operating system to provide a user interface. Um, the, they're designed to be both run interactively and non-interactively. Um, the most common shell that most people use from a day-to-day -day basis is probably uh, GNU Bash. Um, which st the bash itself stands for the born again shell. Um, while the standard shipped on all Linuxes is SH, that's why a lot of times you'll see shell scripts, they will be, uh, they'll use uh, SH as opposed to bash because SH is pretty much guaranteed to be on every environment or every um, uh, Linux or Unix that you interact with. Yes? So when someone says SSH something, they're talking about the shell? 
No, uh, that's that is something different. I do. I, I, it is a little bit confusing. So the uh, SSH is a remote uh, is a remote access program. So I can run an SSH server on a, on on my laptop, and then that would mean that I, from another computer, could log in and get a terminal of of this computer without having to be directly accessing it. That's what SSH is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it, so they don't, the SSH stands for, is it just, is it? Secure shell. It's just secure, secure shell, yeah. So they, it is the same acronym, um, but it's, that's that kind of the idea, is you get a secure connection to a shell on a different box. Okay. Um, <clears throat> In general, your uh, shell syntax will look something like the following, uh, where you have word, space, word, space, word, space, word. So you can imagine the spaces as the delimiters between these words. And so generally, um, you commands will look something like this. This is a ls command. It stands for list. Um, I'm going to go ahead and execute this. And we'll see down here. We have listed, um, and in order of what it said, I first, want, I first li wanted to list the current directory that I'm in. Well, there we go. There's the current directory that I'm in. Then I wanted to list uh, the directory one up. And these are denoted by those dots. So the dot is current directory. Dot, dot means go back one directory. And so I'm going to then list the directory one up from where I am, which happens to be my home folder. So I'll go ahead and see there's, this is all the, the, the crap in my home folder from various other weird stuff that I've had to deal with. And then uh, finally, there is the slash, which represents the actual root of the file system. So then we can go ahead down here and see that we have all of my um, system folders up here at the top down here. So the first word is interpreted as the command. So in this string, ls is the command. And the other words are referred to as arguments. So the dot slash, dot dot slash, and slash are each arguments to the program ls. Uh, for programmers out there, this is the argv that you get in C programs, or um, the arguments that you get when you, uh, when you are programming something. Those, these are what kind of gets passed into the program as you execute it. So where or how are these commands defined? Where, where do you, you know, how do you learn how to use these things? Or well, how, where do you, where on the system are they defined? I, th this is where this is going. So there are built-ins to shells. Um, it sounds a lot more complicated than it is. Built-ins are just programs that the shell provides um, that are executed like commands. Um, these are used oftentimes for scripting. So for an example, bash has you can do an if statement in bash. And the as an, in that example, the if uh, command is a built-in. It's not a command on your system. It's a command that's interpreted by the shell itself. Um, if a command is not found in a built-in, the shell will oftentimes search you the path, which is an environment variable, one directory at a time until it finds the executable of the command name. So we'll go ahead and I'm actually just going to go ahead and do a. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and echo this. Oops. What's it. the point of the dollar sign? Uh, the dollar sign symbols that I'm going to be, uh, that I want to access a environment variable. Oops, there we go. So that's down here at the bottom is my, uh, this is my path. So when I type a command into my shell, it is going to start all the way on the left, and it's going to go all the way, it's going to work its way all the way down until it finds a program in any of those folders that matches the program that I typed. And this is, this is where it finds all the programs. This is how, this is how the shell works. Um, so let's take a look a little bit at kind of your average shell navigation, how to get around. So this is, a, it doesn't quite look like it, but this is, this is a shell. Um, so the first thing I want to do is I want to find out where I am in the system. So I'm going to use this pwd command. Um, and that's going to print my working or current directory. So I'm in slash home slash moody. That's my home folder. So let's see, what's, what's in here? 
Oh, there's a lot of stuff in here. Let's see, we have some scratch, we have some some uh, postscript files, we have some screenshots, all this crap. Let's check out my, let's check out the source directory. So what I did is I used the CD, which stands for change directory. Yep, and then, so now let's see. Uh, I'll make this a little bit bigger actually. It's probably a little annoying to see. Um, so now we're gonna look, um, again, I'm gonna list what's in my source folder. Um, and these are all the different various programs that I, I, I work on generally. Uh, let's see here, we'll, look at, we'll go, go look at ST. This is my terminal emulator source code here. And you can see you can just kind of get around, you know, CD, LS, pretty much it's gonna get you uh, where you want to around the system. Um, LS without any arguments will list the current directory. Um, it's also sometimes nice to uh, kind of peek a directory. I can kind of peek what's up one directory up by just using this, the LS dot dot, dot slash. Um, and so uh, generally those, that's kind of your, your, as far as your basic navigation goes, those will be what you need. If you want to like make a directory, um, you can use the mkdir command. So we're going to make a dir account or a dir folder, and we'll, we'll, we'll list it. And there's nothing in it. So then we'll use something called the touch command to uh, touch a file or create an empty file. We'll ls uh, dir again, and you'll see it has test in it. And uh, let's see here. Well, let's try let's try sending. Um, let's try filling it with some data. So I'm going to use the echo command now, which just means give me what I give you. And so I'm going to give it the words test in all caps. And I want to send that to a file. I want to send that to another program. So I'm going to use a, uh, a, a shell uh, key or a built-in uh, using this uh, greater than sign. And what that means is that you can imagine it as directing the output of this command to whatever file I give it. So I'm going to give it dir test. Great. So I didn't see test come back to me as it would if I did something like uh, this. So it obviously went somewhere. Let's let's see. So I'm going to use the cat uh, command, which is uh, stands for concatenate. I'm going to concatenate this file and my uh, terminal, my standard output. Dir test. There we go. You see, I've, I have populated the file with the command. I didn't have to open it in any editor. I didn't have to do anything with it. I just, you know sent it right there. So what if I want, so then you can also, the, there's, uh, you can use these greater than, less than signs both way. You can pipe out, you can pipe in. Uh, these deal with concepts such as standard in, standard error, and standard out. Um, not, not something that should, not too uh, uh, important for just kind of getting started, but just, you know, to make sure I'm covering what, um, Covering all that I can, you know, not ignoring anything. Yeah, sure, go ahead. When you're trying to go back a directory, do you change the slash um, instead? So dot dots forward slash is up a directory. How do you go back a directory? How do I go in? Uh, so how do I? Um, um, so um, back there, the terminal doesn't have any concept of where you are or where you were. It just knows where you are right now. Like where, like where, where, doesn't know where you were. So do you mean back as in, do I move up a directory or? So like if you were starting at your home directory, okay. let's call that cat, and then you went up to a, the next directory is plus, and you want to go back to cat, how would you do Yes, that? so you just specify the folder name uh, in the argument to CD. So I'm going to. Oh, OK. So it doesn't have to be in a specific order. You just do change directory, whatever yep. you want. Okay. Yep. You, you are, you, the, the file system is your oyster. You can do whatever you want in it. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Now I'm going uh, to showcase another important uh, shell built in that I, I think is important to introduce is the uh, piping. Um, so I'm going to go to source in it. Is it? Is it dir test? No, it's, uh, there we go. So let's see, I, let's say I, I have this file and I want to search for the occurrence, or actually let's do here, for, uh, in, uh, sequence 100, or I in, Sequence 
what is what is what does this want for me? Oh, it's K KSH right now. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going, I just, I'm writing a simple for loop to send uh, all of the numbers between 0 and 100. And I'm going to use a double arrow here to indicate that I don't want to replace the contents, but I want to append it. So it's going to go ahead and do that. And now if I cat the directory, that's a lot of numbers. We have all the numbers between 1 and 100, and at very up at the top, we have a test. So let's come up with the uh, common scenario that of, uh, you know, I want to see if the, the, the file itself contains the number 37. I know it contains the number 37 now, but if I didn't, you know, that's, you know, common use case. So I'm going to concatenate the file. And then I want to take the output of this cat command and give it directly to the input of another command. So I'm going to use the pipe command, which is this vertical bar here. I'm going to pipe it into a um, command called grep. I'm going to search for, uh, I'm going to, I want to search, and that's what grep does. I'm going to search for the occurrence of 37. And what do you know? It told me, hey, look, I found 37 on this line. It just happens that the line itself only contains number 37. If there were other things uh, in addition to that line on the file, then it would uh, print those as well. It prints the whole line that the instance was found in. And so you can kind of see how you can start to create these complex systems by building them out of these small programs that pipe from one into the, other, into the other, into the other, into the other, into the other. And you can create these really cool piped systems together. Um, any questions about the kind of the basic shell meandering around, kind of how to get around in that? Good? Let's see, let me peek. I think this is the next one. Nope, this is the next one. So yeah, what the heck? That's a lot of just arbitrary stuff to keep in your head all the time to use the system. And you're totally right. It is totally just a bunch of arbitrary stuff. Um, but how do people keep all this in their head? Uh, they don't. No one does. I don't keep all this in my head. I know most of the people here don't keep it all in their head. Um, Luckily for you, there is a uh, there is a manual that ships with every Linux software. Oh man, I'll show the answer to my question already. That's fine. <laughs> um, the manual is the most underrated part of the user environment that you're given, by far. Um, it's, it ships with every Linux that you'll deal with. It's a command, just like any other one on the keyboard or on, in your commands line. And its whole purpose is to help you know what's going on. Um, they list all the command arguments for programs, what they do, uh, how they work, uh, just as a beginning. And just as a question, I guess if any of you saw the answer, you don't have to answer. But does anyone know, are user programs the only thing in man pages? It's the most useful part of them, but nowhere near is it all that's there. You have your C library functions, you have your system, you have your boot settings, or not your boot settings, but your boot order. All of these important pieces of learning how your system works are all in the manual page. And the important part about the manual page is not just that it tells you this information, is that it tells you this information for the specific machine that you are using. Because there's 500 different Linuxes out there that people can use, it can be really frustrating sometimes when you're trying to find the solution to a problem, and the solution for the problem is completely different on two different uh, distributions of Linux. However, the man page will always tell you uh, how to the, the man page will always tell you how it works for your specific system for that specific program that you have access to, and that's to me incredibly important for learning how a system works. So yeah, no, everything about your system is in man page. And I mean, seriously, man, man before you Google, um, it will save you a lot of headache, in my opinion. So um, you just type M-A-N? 
Yep, yep. So here I can I can give a little example here. Um, so like about that grep command that I used before. Let's see here. So yeah, oh look, it tells me all my command line arguments. Tells me the description of it. Tells me how to use it. It also just tells me conveniently the sources. This happens to be a modified version of grep, but um, yeah, you this this is here for literally everything in your system. Um, you can look at your C library functions. Here, it'll tell you your function definitions. Um, yeah, and there's the man page really is the best way to, to start learning about your system. Um, I'd recommend it, uh, get familiar with it, and to kind of help you with that, here I've got some uh, useful and interest or use useful uh, tips and tricks for you. So I'm going to start off by I'm going to open this. Uh, I'm going to open the actual uh, man page for man. Kind of funny. There's there's a man page for man, man, man. Um, so this is uh, stuff doesn't really matter. We get down here, this part, sections. Uh, man pages are broken up into nine sections. Each of these sections has a different purpose. Some, the reason why they're separated out into different sections is because sometimes one program will have multiple different uh, man pages that it wants to put in different sections. So for example, I might have a general command. There is a, there is a bash command called read. But there also is a syscall called read. Uh, so how do I how do I keep those two separate? And it's through the use of the man pages. And when you use man, you spe you can optionally specify the uh, the um, the the section by including a number before the thing that you're searching. So this will search specifically um, section two, which is the syscalls and error numbers um, for the word read. And that's what I did before to give me the syscall just itself. Which is oh, it's uh, T, it's T nine. But yeah, here we go. So this this is all my this is this is what I get out when I use uh, like when I'm looking for specifically man two. Um, this command uh, ap apropos, apropos is really nice. It basically is a uh, quick search for all of your man pages. You type apropos and you type the name of whatever you want and it'll search all your man pages for the occurrence of this uh, of that word. Super useful. Um, sometimes uh, functions or programs are not what you would expect them to be called, but apropos can kind of point you, start pointing you in the right direction. Um, you can change your viewer with the environment variable man pager. So I know some people that like to send their manual pages directly to Vim. You can do that if you want. That'd be how you do it. Um, and if you're using the default for man pages, which is a program called less, the forward slash is really convenient because it'll allow you to search for the next occurrence of a string. Um, that, those are kind of the tips and tricks that I use to you know, make sure that I'm using my time efficiently. Um, but they're definitely useful. <clears throat> so let's see. That's. Uh, so how do you get one of these? So how do you go from having uh, you know, nothing to having something set up? So Linux and the GNU core utils are oftentimes packaged to, oh wait, no, this is, oh yeah, they're packaged with X11 to provide one of the out of the boxes experiences. Um, things like Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, Fedora, um, these are all examples of these things, uh, such things called distributions. And they're, they're, um, they're just there to help provide help provide you with a way of using the operating system without having to learn all of the nitty gritty pieces of how everything works together. Um, they, uh, that, that, that'd be the way I'd recommend to go about starting to learn a Linux is pick a distribution, get familiar with how the distribution works, and then get familiar, because um, a lot of those skills are transferable. I mean, you know, shells are going to be the same on any Linux for the most part. So are you know your editor, whatever editor you choose to use, will be transferable. All all this information is is, is really valuable for uh, for you know starting to learn Linux. I have some examples down there. Um, in my two cents, I'm more of a Unix guy than I am a Linux guy. 
Um, so I have list, I have examples of both. For beginners, I recommend Linux. Uh, Unix is a bit less forgiving just because less people use it. So there's less documentation on it. Um, but for Linux distributions, you have Ubuntu, Debian, Linux Mint, Kubuntu, things like that. All of your Debian-based derivatives, these are probably the most used uh, to, for just personal use. Um, then you have kind of your, your enterprise-based system. Red Hat sells a service to use with their operating system, and as such, they have multiple different other spin-offs. Scientific Linux, Red Hat, Fedora, CentOS, all of these are kind of your, what I, what I usually call Red Hatty, Red Hatty Linuxes. Um, then you have a couple of other weird ones. You have like Arch, and Gentoo, and Slackware, and Void which I wouldn't recommend to someone to pick up for their first time dealing with Linux, but if you are using a Linux and you think that it's getting in the, the, the distribution is getting in the way of what you want to do, take up one of the more minimalistic uh, ways or approaches to the Linux and s set it up yourself. And then for Unix, uh, FreeBSD, MerBSD, DragonflyBSD, OpenBSD, and NetBSD are all good examples. My laptop is running OpenBSD. Um, I've quite liked it. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much, that, that's, that's what I got, you know, that's kind of a real, real quick and, and I could guess not really quick, it was like, what, like 40 minutes? Yeah, uh, kind of a, a, a somewhat quick introduction into hopefully uh, the different moving parts of the Linux, how they work together, um, and how you can kind of like context what you're interacting with with the computer and how it, how it all works together. Um, any questions about anything that I covered? Any questions about stuff that I didn't cover that people have questions about with Linux or Unix? Because I can answer those too. Great. So uh, yeah, thank you guys for coming.